And so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for um, coming to USSO and BAS co-organized workshop, Turn the Page, uh, from PhD dissertation to book manuscript. So we are USSO and BAS. Uh, USSO is uh, uh, the biggest uh, postgraduate and early career research network and a publication affiliated with the BAS, British Association for American Studies. And um, some of you might know us and uh, we uh, publish uh, researches, books, uh, reviews and event reviews and uh, um, at, uh, sorry, special serious uh, editing work. So if you're interested in uh, make a contribution to our um, publication, you can contact us uh, through uh, this email address. You can also follow our Twitter, um, USSO online. And we also organize uh, the book hour, uh, USSO book hour event. So if you have uh, any latest uh, publication released, uh, you can contact us. We can invite you as uh, uh, the invited speaker. And uh, it is a monthly USSO book hour Zoom talk. Um, and now I will give the floor to Ali, Ali, would you like to introduce Bass? Yes. Uh, so, hi, I'm Ellie. Uh, I'm third year PhD uh, candidate at American Studies, and I'm a PG rep for Bass, which is, as uh, June said, uh, British Association of American Studies. Uh, I won't bore you much with things. I will just highlight that these kind of initiatives and others are really something um, we would like to encourage. Um, and support as far as much as we can. So if you have any ideas for organizing an event or um, introducing a new reading group, research group, um, whatever kind of uh, format, uh, please feel free to approach and, and, and be in touch. Uh, we have the BAS Postgraduate Symposium coming uh, at the end of the month on the 28th. You can also follow that on Twitter or on the BAS website. And we are also doing uh, work in progress uh, sessions uh, on a monthly basis. Um, the winter sessions are all booked, but we will release new dates uh, after New Year. So it was really, it's really nice to see so many of you coming and I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So today we uh, have the great honor to invite three excellent researchers Dr. Hannah Rose Murray, Dr. Harriet Err, and Dr. Thomas J. Cobb. Uh, they are going to share with us their publishing experience. Um, the first speaker will be Dr. Hannah Rose Murray. Uh, Dr. Hannah Rose Murray is an early career uh, lab Hume fellow at the University of Edinburgh. Her research focuses on recovering and amplifying formerly enslaved African American testimony, including forgotten slaves' narratives, oratory, and visual performance, specifically focusing on their transatlantic journeys to Britain between the 1830s and the 1890s. She has created a website and uh, you can see the link here, uh, that maps their speaking locations uh, across Britain and has organized the numerous community events, including talks, performances, podcasts, plays, and exhibition on both sides of the Atlantic. Her first book, Advocates of Freedom, African-American Transatlantic Abolitionism in the British Isle, was published in September this year by Cambridge University Press. If you're interested in Hannah uh, Rose's book, you can see it here. And now uh, let's welcome Hannah Rose to share with us her invaluable experience of publishing her first monograph. Hannah Rose, yeah. Thank you. I'm not sure about invaluable, but hopefully there'll be some hints for, for some of you anyway. Um, thank you so much to uh, everyone who's organised this event and for inviting me to, to be here. Um, before I start, I just want to make really clear from the beginning that I'm coming from a really unique and privileged position. I'm going into my second year as a Levy Hume Fellow at the University of Edinburgh, which has actually allowed me dedicated time to finish 
this book and I was so lucky to have that I'm so lucky to have this position I, I you know I'm not teaching I wasn't teaching at the time I didn't have huge admin responsibilities I'm not a parent or carer uh, sorry parent or carer even um, and I want to acknowledge that obviously in the face of a global pandemic right now one that's disproportionately affecting uh, people of color a year that's seen a lot of Black Lives Matter protests and the stresses of lockdown for for all of us particularly those who are trying to finish a PhD try and get a job hold down a job in the face of cuts um, I've had the advantage of a research position, which obviously not everyone will have during this process. And the reason why I'm stating that up front is that sometimes academia can be a really difficult and, and sometimes toxic environment when there's a lot of pressure to publish to, or pressure to do X, Y or, or Z to try and get a job or board up your CV. I know I had that as well. A lot of pressure um, uh, a few years ago. And, and for those folks who are currently doing their, their PhD, I have just finished a PhD or are struggling to write a book proposal to, to complete a book in the midst of a global pandemic plus the precarity of academia, um, which was terrible even before the pandemic. Uh, it's all a lot. So just be mindful of your, your current position and, and don't make a situation that's toxic for yourself or your mental health because someone else has or hasn't published a book. So I just wanted to kind of note that up front. But the other thing that uh, might be slightly different with my situation as well is that I actually started collecting primary source material for this particular book, Advocates of Freedom, uh, two years before my PhD. I actually started way back in 2012. Um, so the book that's actually just come out is a result of about eight years worth of, of work. For some of you, it will be shorter. And for others, it might be uh, slightly longer than that. And depending on your situation, it will be very, very different for everyone. There's no sort of timeline or straight track. But what I'm going to do um, over the next sort of 10, 15 minutes is run through my experience of book publishing and then offer some general tips if folks would find that uh, helpful. Thank you for sharing that. That's really great. Um, so I had absolutely no idea on the whole process uh, of, of doing of doing this. So uh, forgive me if you already know some of it, but I'll just sort of outline um, sort of my experience with it. But for the book Advocates of Freedom, um, which came out a couple of months ago, um, I submitted my PhD in early November 2017. I passed my Viva in January 2018 with, with no corrections. So if you're looking for a specific time frame, it took um, just over two and a half years for um, my book to be published in terms of just the whole sort of process. So when I submitted my PhD in November, I, I refused to look at it for a little while. Um, <laughs> and then sort of a month and a half later, uh, when I was sort of prepare, uh, prepping for the Viva, I actually then started to look for presses that might suit so Cambridge University Press had a sort of slavery um, series, a slavery and emancipation series, and was about to publish a book by Richard Blackett, A Captive's Quest for Freedom, which is a really great book. And uh, because Blackett is one of the best scholars um, in slavery and abolition, and particularly transatlantic abolitionism, which is what my book is about, um, this seemed like a really, really good fit. So I emailed them first uh, and they expressed an interest. So I went ahead and, and wrote a proposal which um, involved me pitching the work to them, highlighting the main arguments, um, who the old audience might be, a chapter outline with sort of mini descriptions for each chapter, a word count, a competition in the markets, a list of illustrations if there were any, uh, and a date of when I could deliver the final manuscripts, um, a CV, and, and also um, the press asked me to, uh, to include three sort of sample chapters, as it were. So your preference, time commitment and the press as a whole will decide whether you completely revise, for example, two or three chapters ahead of time or the whole man manuscripts. And, and I know from talking to others that some people prefer working on the whole book itself before writing the proposal because some of the arguments or details might change uh, and then the whole book can be submitted. But I think the advice or what I would say is fine, whatever is, is best um, for you. But regardless of whether you send the whole thing or just a few chapters, there's um, at least six months to wait while there's a decision. And, and luckily, mine was a, a yes and came back with some really supportive uh, feedback, as well as some really helpful, uh, critical feedback. And um, shortly afterwards, the contract came through with all of the style gui uh, guidelines, uh, etc. So I had about a year to make the revisions. Originally, it was about nine months, but I did actually ask for an extension, which is absolutely fine to do. I really panicked about asking for an extension and I was really nervous about uh, about it. And I, I spoke to a couple of colleagues and uh, apparently it happens more than you think and quite a lot. So um, that was really good to know. And I think that is a good thing to know, because, again, um, let's take 2020 as an example. There's been a lot of things going on um, and it's perfectly OK to ask a publisher um, for an extension if you should uh, need it.
but I finally submitted the, the manuscript in, in early November uh, 2019. And in, in terms of sort of the process of transforming the PhD into the book, I actually found it really hard to know what to drop or know what to do. And I uh, lazily really wanted a, a manual to sort of help me or advise me to do that. But one of the main things is um, the lit review at the start, although I actually still included some historiography in, in certain places. And so your mileage may vary on that. But if you can, what I actually really enjoyed is um, putting some more primary source material back in. That was a really fun part for me. Um, and once again, I was really lucky because I had a lot of material that I couldn't actually fit into the PhD. So I could add that into the into the book. And I, I built on that with some new secondary source um, stuff and enveloped that all together. So just to give you another specific example, um, my book focuses on black abolitionism in the British Isles um, and amplifying their literary, visual and oratorical testimony. So I theorized a strategy called adaptive resistance, which African-Americans were essentially using to inform the transatlantic public about slavery. And this rested on performance and exploitation of print culture and the cultivation of anti-slavery networks. And long story short, if an activist managed to sort of balance those three nodes all together, then their visit to Britain or Ireland was ultimately successful. I mean, maximizing the anti-slavery cause. Um, so one of the key things here was the ability to adapt to a British climate. And the, some of the feedback that I got from reviewers was that I hadn't really explained that particularly well. Why was this strategy uniquely British? Could it have happened in the US? Um, how were African-American political strategies different uh, in Britain? And, and actually what, what it meant to be successful, what does the term successful from mean? So that was actually quite a big change that, um, uh, was one of the biggest differences between the PhD in particularly in terms of the introduction and also the book but structure or, or chapter wise my, my book isn't actually you know entirely dissimilar from the PhD but the language and the length of analysis I would say is a lot longer um, so as I mentioned I took out a lot of the lit review stuff um, did keep some of it but incorporated a lot of reviewer feedback in, into the introduction and the conclusion um, in, in particular um, just to kind of step back to the sort of the process of it, because um, I didn't realize this when I was sort of going on this journey, you get sent a lot of, uh, you get sent even a lot of documents like marketing questionnaires to fill out, um, spreadsheets about the images that you need. Um, once the manuscript, manuscript is submitted, you often get questions or issues about edits or finalizing any mistakes you've made through simple human error. So footnotes and formatting, for example, and then it's waiting for the, the proofs to come through, which depending on the press uh, might take six months. And those proofs actually, just to say, are usually sent in a PDF and you can answer any questions on language and formatting, footnotes, primary sources, anything that the press aren't clear about or want clarification on. So eventually my, my book was, was finally published um, uh, in September this year, as I mentioned. And just before I go into sort of explaining some of the tips that I've written, um, I also wanna briefly share another story of another manuscript, which I've just finished, which is an anthology um, focusing on Frederick Douglass's time in Britain and Ireland during his three transatlantic visits in 1845, 1859 and 1886. So as I mentioned earlier, I'd begun some of this research uh, sort of as early as 2012. Um, so I had enough sources and info for an introduction uh, and four parts to the, the book, including lost speeches, um, letters, newspaper articles, poems, uh, literary reviews of Douglas's narrative and images and, and things like that. Um, I actually wrote the book proposal for that during my PhD. So that was in 2016. It was rejected from three presses and that whole process um, took a good two years um, because obviously you submit the proposal and then there's time to wait for it back and you know so uh, yeah reje rejected from three presses I then pitched the proposal to Professor John Cuffman McKivigan from the Frederick Douglass papers and, and he very generously agreed to work with me as a co-author so we reworked the proposal it got rejected again uh, from another press um, but it finally finally found home at Edinburgh uh, University Press so I, I'm not going to say too much about the process for this one because it's an anthology so a lot of the groundwork involved checking transcription of sources and footnotes and adding in this all sort of biographical annotations about people Douglas had uh, mentioned. But um, I actually wrote some of the introduction in, in, in lockdown and, and a really big problem for me then was obviously, as I'm sure a lot of you are experiencing, uh, accessing some secondary sources and primary sources and just accessing archives was actually really, really difficult. And um, particularly when you're trying to contact archives um, to say, you know, um, can I have permission for this image? And obviously the archives are closed and then there's a lack of, um, you know, workforce and stuff like that. But eventually we handed the manuscript in at the beginning of August this year, and I'm actually still waiting for one image um, to send to the press. 
So Edinburgh is actually really, really fast. So they've already sent some things for me to check or for us to check. So spelling or transcription mistakes, anything awry with the footnotes or any other human errors that we've made. Um, and they're working on the proofs right now and, and hopefully it will be published in April. So August, April it is really, really quick. I really wasn't expecting that and neither was um, Professor McKivigan as well. But one difference between the two presses, uh, actually apart from the speed, is uh, that Edinburgh actually consulted us about the front cover of the book. So Cambridge actually made a mistake and released an image of the front cover of my book. And I only found out about it because I was in a meeting with someone and someone randomly said, oh, your book is now on Amazon and it has a front cover. And I hadn't approved that. And I was told that this wasn't a huge deal, but obviously it's my first book, so it's kind of important. But most importantly, I should say, is that I'm, I'm writing, about, uh, writing about black authorship and, and visual imagery. So obviously that wasn't ideal uh, to try to avoid that uh, happening. So just in the last um, sort of few minutes of um, uh, my talk, I would just sort of focus on some of these tips that um, I have here and hopefully some of them might be helpful for you. So um, when you identify a book publisher, think about the themes in your book, what publisher um, sort of does it align with? Is there a particular series it could fit with? Um, once you've identified um, the book series or, uh, or publisher, um, contact them, you know, and in the email, think carefully about how you're going to sell your book, make it concise and enticing. This is, you know, your book, your research, your passion. So make sure to mention, obviously, the book's argument and also to say what's unique about it, but get across that passion. And most book proposals for each publisher are, are fairly similar, but obviously remember to identify what's different and, and really closely align your book with a series um, or the or what the publisher is is um, looking for and if you receive a rejection don't think it's a personal slight on your work your book your PhD it might just not be the, the best fit for a series um, but regardless spend some time on that and also as I mentioned earlier decide whether um, you want to revise the book first or write the proposal first and again as I said um, that depends on your situation. Um, in terms of a, terms of a time frame, it's a really difficult thing to give advice on, uh, again, because of the precarity of academia, the pandemic, life, everything else, the amount of time you will have will be dependent on your situation. So, as I mentioned, I, I've been lucky because I have a leave for Hume Fellowship, so I could actually dedicate a good amount of time to revising, reading and adding more research in. But the most important thing is obviously not to rush it. You need to be happy with, um, with the result. And regardless, come up with a writing routine that is going to work for you. Um, saying that I actually found it really important to spend some time away from the PhD and I suppose the book process if we're going to call it that I wrote a couple of things um, a couple of journal articles actually before coming back to the book which was really great for me to theorize and think through things that are obviously linked um, but sort of it enabled me to kind of go back to my original work and look at it really diff differently and that might seem really simple and obvious but perspective is a really key thing as obviously the more we read absorb and, and process and the more that time goes by the you know the different our writing and analysis is going to be um, another thing is obviously spend some time thinking about what you don't need in there obviously the planning um, before you actually get to this to the revising part is what's going to take you the longest so I mentioned thinking about what you can potentially get rid of a lot of the lit review for example um, and as I said depending on the nature of your book some of it might have to stay in but most of it can come out um, and I found rereading a lot of the primary source material really helpful as I shoved a load of stuff back in that I'd previously dismissed or I'd cut out with a PhD. Um, another thing I found really helpful was to make a revision checklist. And it sounds really simple, but I like lists. Um, so you can put everything that you need to do on there. So feedback from reviewers to incorporate in, uh, adding new secondary source materials, things like index and formatting and, you know, what font it needs to be in and things like that. So you can just take it off. Um, so another thing is apply early for image funds. So if you have illustrations in your book, some of the images will come with a cost when you ask for permissions in terms of um, uh, sort of through a library or archive. Think about the early and whether you um, want to find some grant applications to help you with those costs. Uh, some of it can get quite expensive. And, and, and similarly, apply for these image permissions early. Um, make a spreadsheet of all the images you need, roughly where you want them in the text. Obviously, just a particular chapter is fine as the publisher will send you a detailed form to fill out anyway. Um, and put the contact details of the archive or library so you can send an email to request permission. I mean, that can take several, several weeks. Um, and the other thing as well is that for those of you who will need um, quite a lot of images, the, the, it needs to be a minimum of 300 DPI. 
Um, just the last couple of points, leave a good amount of time for formatting. It takes longer than you think. And I uh, struggled with that because I did not leave long enough um, for that. Um, don't expect to make a huge amount of money. <laughs> Obviously, your royalties will be about 2%. Uh, 2%, that is, not 20. Um, and I knew that already going in, but uh, it's always uh, still a little bit of a shame when you see it on your contract. Um, but the last thing I'll say is about the index. I actually did this myself because I thought it would be a really handy skill to learn, but it actually took me four days straight. Um, and when I emerged from that haze, um, my personal opinion would be if, if you can get the funding or you can afford to get someone else to perhaps do that for you, um, then go for that. I, I found it quite difficult and, and I can actually, I'm going to be really honest, I can see one mistake in my index already, um, so which is uh, hugely annoying. So um, I think that's also, um, uh, you know, really, really important. Um, I think um, I'm sure there's a lot that I could say and I, I've probably missed. Um, but one thing I, I will very, very quickly say is um, I think a, a lot of uh, speaking to a lot of, of friends and colleagues, uh, one question is about and we can get into this in the Q&A maybe because I'll be interested to hear what um, uh, the other speakers think. But how much to publish your PhD in, in, in journals and in journal articles. So a lot of um, uh, I kind of use certain aspects and certain uh, keys and uh, key ideas and theories in some of the journal articles, um, but largely the, the book is 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 very new. Um, and I, I'm going to use the air quotes original uh, material, but um, we can get in, into that in in the Q and A. Um, and uh, yeah, so feel free to ask me any questions. And I do have to leave about course past five, so just to kind of um, shove that out there. But thank you all so much, and I will now be quiet. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Hannah Rose. That is incredibly useful. Thanks so much. And uh, um, so since uh, Hannah Rose is uh, going to leave early, so uh, when we move into our uh, question and answer session, if you have uh, any questions that you want Hannah Rose to address, uh, you can uh, ask them first. Okay, so our, uh, just a minute, our second uh, speaker today. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'm going to share the book here first. Sorry, because uh, for, uh, our second speaker today is uh, Dr. Harriet Er. Uh, Dr. Harriet Er is a senior lecturer in English at Sheffield Hallam University and the author of uh, Comics and Introduction 2020. Uh, I sent the link here. And uh, Comics, Trauma, and uh, New Art of War. Uh, this is uh, the link of. Uh, First monograph. Um, her research interests include violence, trauma, and biopolitics in comics and popular culture. She is in the early stages of her second monograph on the topic of true crime and uh, serial killers in comics. Her publications span the field of popular culture studies with recent articles in the European Journal of American Culture and the Comics Grid. Dr. Er sits on the editorial board of uh, Comics Forum. So uh, welcome Dr. Harriet Er, and uh, thank you so much for sparing time um, to yeah, give us uh, your presentation on, and sharing with us your publication experience. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for um, for inviting me. I don't have any visuals at all, so I'm just going to talk to you. Um, you'll notice maybe that my background has changed. Um, my next door neighbour has decided to do some DIY. So uh, it might be that it gets a bit, I, I've just sent my, my partner to go and tell them off. So hopefully we will have some time. But if it gets really bad, I might have to yeah cut it short because they're, they're drilling holes in the wall. So which is just a great time of day to do that. OK, so um, monographs, PhD to monograph. I will uh, I, I will couch all this in uh, a bit of information about how I how I did mine. 
um, which I have I have here. Ta -da! Um, it came out in paperback this year, so I'm super excited about that. And also the fact that I'm uh, a series editor as well. I have a series with Routledge. It's called uh, Global Perspectives in Comic Studies. So I read an awful lot of PhD to monograph proposals that people are have written, especially from German scholars. So if anyone is here from Germany, welcome. And um, I have some please don'ts for you later, perhaps. Um, so the first advice is don't panic. Don't panic. This is a situation that you, we will all be in when we have our thesis. What do we do with this thing that we've just spent however many years doing? And the worst thing you can do is panic because there is so much advice out there starting with us this evening. My, my journey, well, please do not take me as um, an, an advisable way of doing things. This is just the way that I did do it. Uh, so I passed my PhD without corrections in 2014 in December and I was nine months before I got my first academic post and I used that nine months to formalise my proposal, my monograph uh, manuscript and to do all of the all of the paperwork which did seem never ending at one point. Um, having been to the, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, Heidelberg University Spring Academy, and I know that some people here are also alumni of that brilliant, Tom is waving at me. Um, I had been quite lucky in that one of the uh, organizers, uh, Dorothea Fisher Hornung, had already published a book with the press that I was really interested in. And she said, I will email them for you. So if you can get any kind of introduction to a press, that can be really fantastic. And, and she didn't really push at all. She just emailed them and said, hey, Harriet is going to send you a proposal. Please, could you take a look at it? It's good, which was very generous of her and did help. But it isn't essential for getting into any, any press at all. Um, I, I've sent off my proposal with the monograph, with the full manuscript, which I had done absolutely no work to, apart from in Word, I'd done replace, and I'd replaced thesis with book. Um, <laughs> I needed to get it out. I needed it not to be on my desk anymore. And I received a very lovely, very generous email saying, how have you uh, changed this from your thesis? How is this different? So I had to do a little, little bit more work on it. It went off for peer review. It was six months in peer review. And when it came back, they said, yeah, there is a lot of work that needs to be done. We don't like the fact that you you've used Freud, like but Freud's all the way through it, but they didn't like that. And I had to write another chapter because they didn't like the fact I hadn't talked about gender, but it was good work, it needed to be done. The thing that uh, the experience of rewriting the monograph really drew out for me was all of the things that were missing in a PhD. And I don't mean missing in a bad way. I mean, all of the things that a PhD thesis just doesn't do. And so when you get your review, you might look at it and think, oh my goodness, there is so much missing. It's not, it's, it's a very different fish. And I think people who think that a PhD thesis is a monograph are not really very sure about what a thesis or a monograph are. So um, it can be very useful if you are able to get hold of somebody in your field, say, hey, I've got your thesis through ethos, I'm gonna read it in conjunction with your book and see where the differences are. So actually putting the two together to see how things have changed. I found that a very interesting experience and very, very helpful. Uh, my, so my, it got uh, picked up, I got my contract, um, it was fairly depressing in the amount of royalties I got. I did get more than 2% though. Uh, American university presses are the way forward. <laughs> they pay the most at 4%. Woo um, and it took, oh gosh, let me think. So it came out in, yeah, it was probably two years. It's, uh, it's about two years. The thing is, once you get the contract and you can start saying to people, I've got the contract, that makes a difference, especially if you're in the job market. And uh, it came out, I had a launch. I've kept looking at it since. It's like a child that I'm 
I'm sort of slightly in love with. Uh, and, and that was how, <clears throat> how it became a thing. In terms of the advice, I think what Hannah Rose has already said has been fantastic. You've covered everything. There's not necessarily much for us to add, but a couple of points that I would like to mention. When you're thinking about where to publish your book, the best resource that you have is your own bibliography. So thinking about who are the writers who you, uh, the academics that you kind of sit next to on the bookshelves, if you think about a library bookshelf, who would you be with? Where are they being published? Uh, are there series that make particular sense? So um, for example, if you're looking at anything to do with global comics, I have a series. And when you put it into Google, it will come up. So are there places that make specific sense? And the useful thing about series is that, oh, excuse me, a series editor is usually an expert in that field. So the feedback that you receive should be um, top quality, one would hope. So looking at your bibliography and thinking about where are the presses that are already publishing the stuff that I'm reading. So for me, I'm in comic studies. The only option I saw was the University of Mississippi because they publish everything that's good, I think. You can also speak to editors and to presses. So you can send them an email saying, this is who I am, this is my research, I am going to be looking for a publisher for a text on this, is this something that fits? And they might ignore you, you might not get a reply, but you probably will. There's nothing wrong with that. So going out and asking questions and you can ask as many people as you want. You don't have to speak to just one press at once. You can only send your proposal to one at once, but speaking to them, yeah, speak to everyone. Why not? It's, it's an email, it's a, little, it's a little bit of advice that might be useful. And they might say, no, we don't want this, but have you seen this person who might want this? Uh, and also don't be scared to ask your supervisors or your mentors or anyone who you trust for their advice. Have they worked with a press? Uh, what did they think of a particular press? Um, are there any that they, they wouldn't necessarily want their worst enemy to work with? Um, and I think I'm not gonna say who it is for me, but there is one that I would never recommend to anyone. That's okay getting advice because it's going to be a long process. You're going to have to I say, get through it like it's something you're tolerating. But if it's a difficult process because of the people that you're working with, it will be incredibly stressful. Um, and this is a piece of advice which isn't for everyone, but images. So Hannah, as you mentioned images, getting image permissions. Images are the, the bane of my existence um, comics, of course, lots of images, they are a nightmare. One very useful tip is that American presses, especially American university presses, are governed by American fair dealings laws. And if something is being used for academic purposes, it is covered by fair dealings and you do not need to pay. So uh, in my book, I, I politely emailed Mount Marvel and said, can I use this panel? And they said, no. So I thought, damn. And then I found out about fair dealings laws and I included the images and they have never tried to sue me yet. There are some places where you might want to pay for an image. Uh, there are some, for example, uh, if I'm using a small creator and they say, yes, can I have 20 quid? Sure. But certainly for big companies, if you are with an American university press, you do not need to worry about image permissions because they will be free and under fair dealings. Uh, if anyone would like some more information on that, uh, I'm more than happy to talk about that. And uh, I can send you the templates I use as well to, to show that it's, it's sort of legally used. For UK and UK university presses, um, I don't know what the laws are, but... Uh, in general, you do need to, to pay something and it can be extortionately expensive, just to warn you. Um, the other thing to say is that a monograph is not the be all and end all. Some projects don't lend themselves to a monograph and that's okay. Most of us here for American studies, I'm imagining that we're in the humanities, in literature, history, film, sit 
they, these are all subjects that do lend themselves to the monograph. But you might have something and think, you know, I can get more if I send this to a certain number of really good journals. And that is OK. The people to speak to about that would be supervisory team, mentors. But this idea that we absolutely have to have a monograph to our name, it's wonderful and it's a brilliant thing to have but it's not necessarily the absolute be all and end all. And if you do get rejected several times, that might be the sign that this isn't right for you. And that's okay. You have to remember that you are the expert. It's a tricky one, but you are the expert. Um, imposter syndrome, I know you'd be like, no, I'm not an expert in anything, but you are. And so when you have your reviews, when you're put, putting together your monograph, when they're saying, oh, we should do this, you are the expert. You are the one who is going to say, yes, that works for this project, or no, this doesn't work. And you're coming from a place of expertise. You are allowed to say these things. You are allowed to make choices about your own work. And if you are with a press that is not letting you make choices, it's a bit like being in an abusive relationship. Don't, don't stay in it if you can. Um, it's easier before contract to leave, of course, because breaking contract can be tricky. But I have heard cases of people who have been told that their publication name is changing, that they're not publishing as Bill Smith. They're publishing as William R. Smith, which is not who they think they are. They're not allowed to pick cover images. They're not allowed to decide on certain things. So if you are in that kind of publishing relationship, get out of it, really, I would say. Um, the, the only other thing I would add that I'd, um, at this stage is read. And it sounds ridiculous. I know we're all PhD students and you're thinking of God, read, fine, read enough, Harriet. Don't tell me to read more, but read. And, and read the kinds of stuff that's coming out in your field. How is it being phrased? How are, the, how are people putting arguments forward? How are monographs in your particular field working? Because again, they might not be the same as, as your thesis. And if you're looking to restructure and you think, oh, am I gonna go this way or this way? Well, what kind of thing is being published and, and what kind of thing works? So um, it sounds like bizarre advice, but really reading and making sure you're up to date especially with the stuff that's coming out of your chosen press can be really helpful in, in getting you to, to find the right fit for you. Oh, and one more thing, have a book launch and don't make it serious. Just have a great big party and get drunk. <laughs> um, sorry, that wasn't very academic, but definitely have a book launch. Definitely boast about it everywhere. Wave copies in people's face and um, yeah, celebrate it. It's a bloody massive achievement so people who say that a book launch is not necessary well they're just jealous I think I'll stop there <laughs> oh thank you so much every word is just goes into my mind and also heart it's just a thanks so much for your like sharing part of your life experience and it's also part of your life thanks so much it's very um I mean helpful and touching and uh, yeah that's very good thanks okay so uh i'm going to um introduce uh, the third invited speaker today dr thomas j cobb uh, here and um, dr thomas j cobb is an academic uh, writing tutor and a module lecturer at Coventry university and the author of uh, American Cinema and Culture Diplomacy, the fra Fragmented uh, um, Kaleidoscope, uh, uh, published uh, this year by Palgrave. He has also convened and taught American Studies modules at the University of Birmingham. His research interests encompass American foreign policy, the allegorical role of Hollywood cinema since uh, the Vietnam War and uh, Sceneries between popular culture and U.S. political dynamics. He has published articles in both American Studies and Film Studies journals, including American Studies in Scandinavia and Film International. 
he hopes to pursue a second monograph on affinities between the content of Hollywood films and political ideologies imparted in the American presidency. Uh, one piece of uh, good news is that uh, uh, Tom is going to uh, launch a series uh, for USSO. Uh, that is uh, uh, Hollywood uh, like movies or Hollywood novels uh, in the age of uh, uh, Trump. Um, so if you are interested in, you just uh, keep an eye on our website and social media. And uh, you can also contribute to this uh, series uh, if you want to write a uh, short like 1000 words essay. Okay, so Tom, the floor is all of yours. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, June. And thank you, Harriet and Hannah for being so candid. I admired how extemporaneous you were and you've inspired me to counterbalance the more systematic side of my talk. So thank you for that. Um, I published my monograph with Palgrave Macmillan this year. They are a slightly more commercial publisher. So I think there, there are many differences in terms of um, social conventions, um, correspondence between uh, an outfit like Palgrave and perhaps a university press. So that's one element of difference I can speak to. In terms of my relationship with that publisher, they um, they were really lovely and, and diffusive and, and, and nice and they, they gave me so much autonomy once the book proposal had been accepted. So that was a really wonderful um, dynamic. What I, I want to speak about today is the, the path which led me to publishing the monograph and the, um, the more unpleasant difficulties I had getting there. So I'll just share my screen. Um, So you can all see that okay? Yes, we can. Brilliant. Um, so I started my PhD in January 2014 and completed it in June 2018. And what my PhD explored, it explored the allegorical role of films from the Clinton era to the Obama era, specifically in foreign policy and international relations. So looking at films as diverse as um, Free Kings, The Dark Knight, No Country for Old Men, and viewing them as synergetic in some way with international relations theory and US statecraft. And I only really contemplated the transforming of the PhD into a monograph at my Viva when it was encouraged to me by my um, primary examiner that day. I'd, I'd thought about it before, but it only really became tangible at that point. So my advice um, to many of you is when you get to your Viva, try and keep an antenna out for talking about um, advice for publishing your PhD as a monograph. I'm, I'm sure um, your examiner will be willing to give you that advice. So your, um, your Viva examiner is, is potentially another person you can talk to besides the people in your department, your supervisors, um, your peers. So do you see that as an option? option. Um, so the time scale, um, I've been foolishly sentimental. Um, that's me on the left at my PhD graduation in December 2018. And that's a screenshot of my book um, available for the um, economic price of £64.99 from Amazon in July of this year. Um, so I actually finished my PhD in June 2018. Um, so it's been a, about a two year turnaround to get it, get it published in July, which I'm told is, I, I think, reasonably okay. Um, I was very lucky in that, that um, I started emailing Palgrave Macmillan about the project in September 2018. Um, I corresponded with them on chapter length um, potentially expanding the book to include more material. And I emailed them a sample chapter to be peer reviewed along with a de detailed plan proposal for the monograph. And to my shock, I found that it had been accepted in early November 2018 and I'd received a very positive review, some caveats, some recommendations for improvement. But on the whole, the endorsement was, um, was quite 
um, was quite positive. So I was surprised by that. I thought it was going to be rejected and I was going to have to go back to the drawing board. So um, that I did not expect um, about six months from completing the PhD to be at this stage. So I think it is a stressful process um, looking to get a monograph accepted, but you can be surprised. And I think like so many things in life, um, be phlegmatic, um, bounce back from rejection, um, but you, you never know what can happen. Um, I think one major differentiator between proposing a monograph and proposing a PhD is the marketing element. And I've included a screenshot from my original proposal, which I found the other day. Um, so I had to really stress who the audience is, who it's for, um, why there might be a gap in the market. And it's kind of something of a balancing act. Um, you, ha you have to mention other books in your field, which your monograph might bear similarity to, but you also have to say what it's doing differently, how it's filling the gap in the market. If you say um, nothing like this has been done before, that's very foolhardy because the publisher can just retort, well, that means there's no market. Um, if there's no precedent, then why should we bother with you? So um, when you write the proposal in terms of the marketing section, um, be sure to um, stress where your research fits, but also its originality. Um, marketing is about both the precedented and the unprecedented, if, if that makes a sort of sense. Um, the other element of that is mentioning competition. So who, who you are competing with, in my case, with Palgrave, um, their proposal um, document asks you to mention who you're competing with. And that was slightly strange. I, I never kind of had to deal with that before in an academic context, and it felt slightly corporate and, and more commercial, which Palgrave most definitely is, but there's a way of, of kind of squeezing out positivity from this section. So you say how perhaps your work is similar, but also different from other books in your field. Um, you stress the areas it's going to cover, which those books don't cover. Um, in my case, this is what I had to do. And you kind of do that while being very polite and cool um, and nice, which, which is, again, it, it's something of a a balancing act, but it's perfectly doable. Um, in the peer review report, you might well receive criticism in spite of um, getting an endorsement, in spite of getting your project endorsed. And that's perfectly fine. Um, that, that's perfectly normal. Um, a bit like the PhD itself in that sense, you get minor corrections. That's a brilliant, commendable result. Um, so um, in my case, there was a concern that there was a lot of broad ideas, a lot of films, and it was unwieldy and could be a bit more um, like a series of vignettes rather than a cohesive book, a bit more like an edited collection. So I bore that in mind before I got down to the writing process. So um, I think reading the screenshot is kind of helpful because you get a sense of where I was at the beginning of the process, um, just as has it had been accepted. And this was um, a peer review from one of the um, authors who endorsed the book for Palgrave, the monograph. So um, very interesting look to look back on this now. And the, um, the sections in bold above are kind of what, um, what might be being asked of the peer reviewers. So, um, the quality of the writing, the likely shelf life of the research, which is how kind of, um, for lack of a better word, fashionable and up-to-date and resonant it's going to be, and any sections that require substantial reworking. So um, this is kind of an inside look at what your peer reviewer might be asked. So my timescale, December 2018, started adapting the PhD the monograph, and I added a lot, lot of new material, um, composed new chapters for much of 2019 and received um, a peer review endorsement um, in March 2020 from um, the reviewer of the finished manuscript. And that was really nice news to receive because I received it about a week 
before lockdown and everything seemed like it was going to hell in the handcart. So it was nice to get that um, positive news in the time of utter uh, disarray and um, stress. So really good um, timing in that sense. Um, I did my indexing process during the first national lockdown. I echo, echo Hannah's experience on this. It is very strenuous. Um, it seemed like a fun hobby to learn in lockdown. Um, and it was kind of nice because it was mundane and I had brain fog. And in that sense, it was kind of an ideal listless activity to do. Um, but it's helpful if you can get a professional um, involved or, or ask someone who knows what they're doing. Um, because indexing for the first time is quite a challenge. And I too spotted a couple of errors um, on my work uh, and on Hannah's experience. So um, bear that in mind for the index. A uh, monitor published in July this year. Um, unlike what Harriet recommended, I, I did not have a book launch party. It was rather a sedate couple of glasses of wine at my house because of the social di distancing uh, conventions. So I, I did not do that, but hopefully you all publish your monographs in more conventional times and you'll be able to have a conventional book party. Um, so hopefully you'll get that. And for lack of a better image quality, here it is, um, but you can also maybe see it up against the camera. Um, and I think there's some important differences in terms of stressing how the PhD read versus how the monograph read. And I've got a screenshot from my PhD here. So the PhD writing is slightly more signposting and essayistic, at least that's my experience. Um, so I, I, there's a lot of signposting in this extract. There's a, there's a lot of um, this thesis, um, the chapter by chapter outline below. Um, it's, it's slightly more essayistic, um, slightly more stuffy. Um, compared to the monograph, I was a little more looser in how I wrote, particularly because Palgrave um, is slightly more commercial. So I wrote slightly more floridly. Um, I, I wrote slightly more, dare I say, bombastically in places. And I think you can, to some extent, get away with that a bit more of a monograph, especially if it's a commercial publisher. Um, so I did kind of change my writing style slightly. And the other thing I really did, which Harriet said she did as well, I got rid of all this thesis um, I, and replaced that with this book. Um, I didn't use the word monograph because I preferred book and Palgrave said I could use book instead. And it felt slightly more um, expansive to use the word book as an alternative. So um, that there's gonna be style differences when you write the monograph compared to the PhD. And that's going to, I guess, involve more work, but it's also going to make it, I think, um, more of a different process and, and be slightly refreshing for that. So um, kind of differences in contents as well. Um, on the right is the contents for my PhD part one. Um, and here on the left and the right are the later chapters and images within my PhD. So um, I think one difference you'll notice between this and the monograph is that the monograph um, added much more and contained considerably more subsections. And you'll be able to see that at a mo in a moment. So um, more subsections, slightly more chapters, um, and generally a more broader overview of the same subject as my PhD. So the monograph was rather beefed up in some senses, but I also had to lose quite a bit of detail from my original PhD. A lot of the, um, the more expansive chapter sections and in individual films were heavily cut down. It's um, slightly more circumscribed in that sense, but I also think it flows better. So there are substantive differences in terms of the, the pacing, um, the volume of material and the, the level of breadth of the research. Um, I've probably finished a bit early, but I'm happy to talk about other aspects of my 
writing experience before I, we move on to questions. Um, I think you will encounter writer's block while you embark on the monograph. It's not quite the same as the PhD. You're not doing it, um, or, or most of the time, you're not doing it within a, a as structured as, as an environment. I started the monograph during a thankfully temporary bout of unemployment, and I carried on writing it alongside working at Coventry University and the University of Birmingham. So you'll, you'll, you may well have to juggle it with other things and it, that lends a slightly different dynamic to when you're doing the PhD and it's the single um, sole focus um, of your, your kind of life. So it's a different dynamic in that sense and it's more of a challenging be challenge because of it. So um, I'm happy to move on to the questions now and, um, and give over to the audience. Um, do you so want me to... Yeah, Tom, would you like to uh, stop sharing your screen and... Uh, oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. I forgot to stop sharing. Um, thanks, oh, Tom. Um, it's, it's very informative and uh, I really appreciate that uh, you would love to share your like samples of uh, what you have written for Pelgrim in your book proposal, especially those marketing part or like competition part. I have never heard about this, but uh, you really dis demystify such kind of uh, process. Okay, so um, thanks sir. Um, the three speakers uh, have uh, shared their very invaluable experience uh, with us. And uh, I, I believe everyone here uh, would love uh, to hear such kind of uh, considerate uh, uh, suggestions. Um, so um, apart from um, having our party to celebrate uh, your new book, you might also let me know because I am the USSO Book Hour organizer. And uh, uh, if you want your book uh, known by more uh, um, people, and uh, um, you can let me know I can, because I can invite you as a um, invited speaker for uh, the monthly USSO book hour. And uh, you can chat uh, your book uh, um, uh, with the more like, uh, yes, the researchers in this field and also the public. Okay, so I will, um, yeah, give the stage to Ali and uh, Ali will moderate the question and answer session. So first of all, I want to thank uh, all three of you. Um, I will join June with her compliment. It was very moving and inspiring. And thank you for sharing from like very personal experience. Uh, we are lucky to have three successful experience uh, with not much rejection. Um, and thank you also for acknowledging yeah, some privileges and, and, and understanding that there's various uh, conditions and circumstances for people um, at different stages and places in their career. Um, I will draw a few things from the, I first have Suzanne uh, that wanted to ask a question and she want to ask herself. So uh, here she is and then I will read some questions out. Yeah, uh, hi everyone, I'm Suzanne. Um, I work at the American University of Beirut and I just have a question about getting started with book revision. So, you know, I have my dissertation, I'm ready to try and transform it into a book, but I open up the document and then I'm sort of struck with this idea of then what? So I would kind of like to hear from you, what is the part that you started with? Did you start by drafting a new introduction or did you make an outline or did you make a list of things that your advisors had told you that you would need to add or change, um, etc. So just any, you know, experience would be appreciated there. Um, so I can go first if that's okay. Um, I, uh, Suzanne, that's a really, that's a great question. Uh, and it's, it's a hard question. So I, um, I had, a, I had a really crap Viva, um, and received no feedback. And so when I got my book feedback, I got, it was 14 pages of notes of things that I needed to change. And it was incredibly overwhelming. Um, so I went through with, the, I printed it all off, saved the forests, I know, but printed the whole thing off. And then I got two colored highlighters, one pink, which was the, this is good and we need more. And one yellow, which was, this is crap, take it out. And I went through everything that the, that the review said, 
and highlighted it and then made in, made my own little notes about where in the pages it was. So that when I went back to make the revisions, if I was thinking, I, I can't, I can't today, I need some good stuff. I could look to the pink. And if I was feeling strong, <laughs> I could go to the yellow. And admittedly, I did the pink first, but it was a way to allow me to know that it wasn't it wasn't actually 14 pages of, of, of crap. It was 14 pages of really, really careful suggestions. And having having the color coding and having the time to just sit and read through it and think, okay, I can see where this criticism is coming from. This I can see where this is coming from and where it needs to go in the work. I mean, it took a day, but it was incredibly valuable because I could then see how other people were reading my book. Um, and I've, I've still got them. It's still a process that I use. Um, and I, I found that really a good way to get to get started. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Amy. Um, would it be possible for you to summarize the difference between a PhD thesis and a monograph? That might be a big question, but thanks for any tip. I would maybe reframe it a bit. Um, maybe Harriet or anybody else uh, can um, share maybe a bit uh, the difficulties of like a bit like Tom did with certain language um, or articulation of ideas. So maybe some of the challenges or one of the comments that you receive in the process of, of revising that you got from the peer review maybe some more specificities on that so to make this question less big and daunting and long um, maybe henna rose would you love to address this question because yeah i can yeah i can say a little bit i mean i um I think a lot of that uh, question was answered really, um, really well by Harriet and, and, and Tom and, and Tom in particular, obviously, it was really helpful um, to see that kind of comparison. I mean, like I mentioned in, um, in my sort of brief chat, I think the main um, struggles that I had was concerning the, the introduction, you know, my structure and my chapter outline actually didn't change that much. And, and, and again, it, it will be very, very different depending on the press, depending on your your PhD. I had a few struggles with um, someone try, uh, the, someone at the press wanted me to drop a chapter and there was a little bit of a fight there, but that's another story. Um, but I went through a bit like what Harriet was mentioning. I went through um, sort of the intro and all the chapters and removed like just simple things like removing the word thesis. Um, and I basically kind of highlighted those sorts of words or thesis or PhD or anything like that. Um, the signposting that Tom um, was talking about um, so I not only sort of replaced the word, but then I kind of, whenever I was using the word, it was that kind of, I was already doing the signposting and some of the language there just fit, just felt um, like I was writing for my examiners rather than for um, an audience who would just be really interested, hopefully, really be interested in the subject and in the book as a whole. Um, and as, yeah, as I mentioned, you know, particularly the introduction, um, looks completely different. I mean, I really struggled with writing the introduction um, with the PhD. I basically made a lot of last minute changes um, before I handed it in and it was quite stressful. Um, but so I, I think that was something, there were a couple of ideas in the introduction which just needed more fleshing out. Um, and again, this will depend on your subject and, and your, uh, your book. But also just generally, like for me, I actually added in a lot more material um, to, to um, support some of the stuff that I was saying, not necessarily in, in a kind of like, this person says this, this person that said this, that kind of literary view. Um, but I just had the space to be able to develop my own um, voice as such uh, as an author, if, if that helps. No, oh, thank, thank you, Hannah Rose. This is actually really helpful to envision your potential reader, right? This could really shift the way we approach to the writing while we were so used to write for like a certain kind of, uh, yeah, standards of examination and, and expertise while we can envision other, other kind of thing and maybe experiment more with the prose things that uh, I know for some of us from discussing with colleagues is something that not everybody like or encourage um, in the PhD process. So thank you for that. 
Um, we have another question, which is a bit technical, but I think nonetheless important, uh, about does any of you have any experience of using writing software on Mac or, or not on Mac in general? And if there's something you recommend and if you use something for your PhD or for your manuscript. Um, so I don't know if you are familiar with any kind of softwares. I didn't use any software at all, so I'm going to back out of that question because um, I can't be very helpful. Sorry. Uh, ditto okay. me. I, I'm antediluvian. And um, aside from being able to use Word and pages on Mac, I, I couldn't be able to say anything incredibly specific um, in regard to that question. So I, I will back out also. Um, so I am not a Mac user, but I do use Microsoft OneNote. And I don't know um, if anyone's had experience of OneNote. It's, a, it's basically a digital notebook and you can color code all of these lovely different sections and have, and have sections within sections. And it, it's a really clear way of, of organizing your thoughts. Um, I'm, I'm currently using it to plan a book and it's, it's just having like a section for a chapter and then within the chapter and it's lovely. Um, if you have access to Office 365, which is quite commonly bought by universities as a package, you can access it there. Uh, it, it might work for you. It doesn't work for everyone. Some people prefer good old pen and paper, uh, but I've, I've found OneNote as a way of organizing my thoughts really, really useful. Thank you. Uh, I have a, another technical question, maybe that can throw us to the beginning of the process. In that first daunting email that you sent out, what do you like? How how long is it? Do you already uh, attach uh, documents, or is it just like smelling the territory first and see like any kind of reaction before? So, how can you share something more about that first really a uh, stressful moment of drafting that email, and also maybe about uh, issues of tone, which is something that is relevant for the writing of the manuscript but also relevant to that first email, how much self-praise or how much, like what kind of tone, how would you describe the balance of a good email, pro email proposal? I, I would say that it's okay to be somewhat circumspect. Um, you shouldn't be too effusive. Um, I um, was polite with Powell Grave. Um, I mentioned um, the nature of my project, um, but I didn't provide too much detail um, and kind of let the proposal and the sample chapter speak for itself. So um, I, I think there's a balance to be struck, um, be polite, be reciprocal, um, but you don't need to be effusive and providing lots of detail um, because you leave that for the sample chapter and um, perhaps the, the proposal document itself. I would say um, something similar in that um, I draft in a sort of simple point, I drafted the email out in a Word document at first and I, I tried to sort of, um, it was helpful for me to try and write almost my book's argument in like a tweet, you know, in terms of like how many characters it is now, 240 is it, um, 280, um, you know, and just to kind of keep it really short and sweet. And I think um, as Tom said, it's important not to, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't need to be like a hugely long email because um, series editors and, and publishers get a lot of pitches and stuff like that. So it has to be um, fairly, um, fairly short, but you actually, you know, you have to sell your book and kind of linking to what Harriet was saying about, you know, it's, it's a really big achievement and, you know, it's, it's a really, really great thing. Um, and you're passionate about your work as well. Uh, you know, it's worth saying, hang on. Yeah, this, because I think, as, as you mentioned, Harriet, as well, I think like imposter syndrome, they're like, oh, God, is it, you know, um, you know, do people, you know, want to read this and stuff like that? Like, people do want to read it. What are the things that you love about your work that is actually going to make an impact? And just having a couple of those um, ideas in your head um, is really important to kind of putting in the body of the email. You know, here's, here's roughly the argument. And, and this is why it's important. This is why it's going to change heads. And I think for particularly those, um, of us in the UK, I think British people, and I'm going to make a huge stereotype here, um, mm -hmm. can be really bad at kind of like um, talking about our own achievements in a way. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's uh, um, trying to get over that and actually just be passionate about your own work. Um, so I'm going to jump in as some, as uh, with my editor hat on. Um, <clears throat> so uh, for my series with Routledge, I get quite a few pictures. 
And in the first email, there are very few things that I want or indeed need to know. Um, so for your short introductory email, I need to know who you are. So um, my name is, is Harriet Earl and I'm a PhD researcher in American studies at Keele University. I am rearing the end of my PhD and will want to submit my manuscript. And it's on this topic, which is what, three or four sentences. Is this an area of interest to your series? Thanks very much. That's all I need to know. Anything more than that gets into the realms of convoluted. We're all busy people. And it's amazing how often people submit to a series without necessarily getting the series pitch. Um, I get a lot of proposals about anime. It's like, I'm sorry, that's not comics. Um, so I can quickly just say, sorry, I, I don't do that. Try here. When you then get your response saying, oh, okay, then you can send the elevator pitch, so to speak, uh, and, and go from there. But really, the first email only needs to be short. Do, don't, don't waste your time or indeed mine with anything too long. Just nice and short and friendly but professional, which I'm sure everyone can manage. Um, you, can, you can go with, you know, dear Dr. Earl, if you like. Some people say dear Hattie, which is also fine. Um, but keeping it nice and short until you can kind of build up that conversation to where we say, I actually really want to read your full proposal. Here is my proposal form. Have at it. Good luck. <laughs> um, because there are all kinds of reasons why a press might not be interested now. And it, it, there's no point in you putting in more work than you need to. Okay, this is really great and useful advice. Uh, also, the not to do. There's another specific uh, question for you, Harit, for your editor hat. If you you mentioned some do's and and, and don't do's uh, in with regard to the proposal, so no, not the email, but rather the proposal. And you mentioned for a German researcher, so maybe you can identify some uh, kind of pitfalls and and current kind of things that you would recommend us to do and not to do in the proposal itself, from your experience. Okay. Um... So as a shameless piece of self-promotion, I have this on my website, which is just harrietl.com. Um, there's a whole, there's a downloadable document about what the proposal should do. Um, and I am, I am so sorry to pick on Germany. And I, I really am. Um, but I have noticed that quite a few German scholars do, do have this habit because I understand that publication is, is massively important before you can even use the title of doctor. And so a lot of people sort of what they want the proposal, uh, they want it to be accepted, they want the contract. Think before you send it, please proofread before you send it. Please don't send it in German. Please don't <laughs> send. Um, I have had whole monographs, man manuscripts sent in German with an email attached said, publish this, please. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, or not. <laughs> And then I'm in that position of having to say, no, I'm not going to do that. And it, it's it's awkward. For, it's awkward for everyone. Um, so thinking, I, I know we all want the contract. We all want to move on to the next stage and have the book and get it done. But just, just hold back a little bit and be a little less keen. Um, if, a, if a series does not accept submissions in German, or in French or in whatever language that you might be writing in, email and ask if, if they accept, but don't just send it and assume. And um, also, please don't ever call me Mrs. <laughs> I get that quite a lot as well. Um, but it's, it's this, I'm, I'm, I am sorry to pick on Germany, and I know that this is, is not a German problem uh, solely, but just being aware of what kind of email you're sending, what kind of information you need to be giving at this point, and that sending a full manuscript is not going to result in a published book in a week's time through your letterbox. Please. Thank you, Harriet. <laughs> uh, I have a question to Hannah Rose because I know you're, uh, you said you might be leaving soon. Um, I was wondering, you said you have a lot of primary sources and, and some images that you're working on uh, issues of representation. Um, 
And you did mention this instance with the cover. And I was wondering how much like freedom did you have in like the design of your book beyond the cover, but the inside. So the inclusion of the images, how would they would be displayed? Like the kind of like the small attention to details that you as a scholar that is working on these themes uh, prioritized. So how did all of that um, interaction um, happened with the publishers, if you can say something about that, because I know I'm in person, personally worried about this kind of thing as someone working with images. Yeah, thank you. That's a really great question. And uh, I think I, there was parts of the whole process where I was like stumbling around in the dark <laughs> and just trying to figure out everything. Um, I mean, as I mentioned, so with the experience that I had with Edinburgh, that was really positive because they pretty much as soon as we sent the manuscript, they said, you know, have you thought about what the front cover is going to be? Um, and, you know, uh, and instantly there was a discussion about, um, uh, yeah, what image uh, did we want on the front cover? Um, how did we want the chapter titles to be displayed on all of the pages? Um, uh, various things like that, like titles and, you know, what, how would you want the, the title of each part to be displayed and, and everything like that. Um, so I, I um, that was really interesting to me because I didn't necessarily get that at Cambridge uh, and I'm not trying to pit one press against another I'm, I'm just sort of sharing my experience and then obviously the huge error with the the image which I found really frustrating and called them out on it um and then was kind of told it you know it was fine it wasn't a big deal but as I, as I mentioned because I I am um, you know I'm, I'm writing in a sort of uh, about black authorship and, and representation uh you know it was very very important for me as I've worked on sort of public history articles and, and other journal articles that have tried to change the image, crop a certain part of, um, uh, you know, Frederick Douglass's face or hair or Ida B. Wells Barnett's hair, um, which obviously gets into um, incredibly oppressive racial dynamics and um, white supremacist tactics and, you know, trying to avoid all that. Um, so, uh, but the what I, when I, uh, one thing I will say about Cambridge is um, I was very um, insistent about because uh, you know don't be afraid as well to sort of say this this is this is your book and in, in your your structure so there'll be certain things that you can't necessarily change but I was very clear on you know I want the acknowledgements to be this long you know I'm not changing who I'm thanking because there's a lot of people to thank um, I'm also not um, uh, wavering on uh, having a trigger warning for my book because obviously I have to you know, I'm discussing uh, racial violence and white domestic terrorism, um, you know, so that had to be in there, um, you know, personally, and, you know, I um, had a dedication there as well. Um, so all, all, all those sorts of things, um, you know, are, as you say, part of the book process, but I think, you, you know, you can, you know, be bold about it, you know, if there's something that you want to say, um, or how you want to design it, then absolutely be, um, be upfront about it. And I, I think now, because I've had the the, the other experience with Edinburgh in the sense that like, yeah, do you want the Frederick Douglass in Britain and Ireland or do you just want Douglass in Britain or like, or however you want that on a page title. And I, that was something I was like, oh, I didn't realize that was a thing. I, I just thought that the press des decided that because I didn't have that conversation in Cambridge. So I think it's useful having that knowledge and just, and there's nothing wrong. And I I'm, realize I'm rambling now, but just to say like, there's nothing wrong with you basically saying, can I just check how this is going to look before you do the proofs or how is this going to work, you know, and actually maybe being a bit preemptive, like I'm not saying that the image experience is going to be everybody's, but, you know, I've thought about this as an image, um, how would it, because with Cambridge as well, I just quickly say, I didn't get really a choice of how that image would look. It was pretty much an image of, of Moses Roper, which I wanted on the front, an African-American activist who traveled around Britain and Ireland. Um, but with, with Edinburgh, they were experienced, they sent me like 10 different options of different colors and different, placement images and, and stuff like that um so yeah i will i will leave it there and i'm sorry i'm gonna have to leave but um if anyone wants to email me um separately um you know my emails on my on my website which i think you shared um and yeah i just quickly say thank you so much for thank you Hannah Rose, so much for your participation <laughs> and congratulation on the book too thank you and thank you to, to tom and harry as well I, I learned so much from um from your talks and um yeah thank you all very much and i hope to speak to some of you soon yeah, thank, thank you, you, Hannah Rose, and uh, look forward to seeing you soon on, on other occasions. Yes, yeah. definitely. Uh, I saw some hands from uh, Katie or Diana. Would you like to ask your question or Brian? Or is this a buy signal? I'm not sure I, I read these signals right. Anybody else has a questions for uh, 
Tom and have yes, yes. Anisha. Hi, thank you so Hi. much to everybody. Um, and uh, a lot of the advice discussed here is incredibly helpful, but in my mind, it gives me ideas for things to do once my PhD is over. I'm currently about six months. I mean, I think I'll, I think I'll take six more months to finish. Uh, and I'm wondering if there's anything I can do at this stage. Um, so to just give you an idea, and maybe Hattie, you can help me because my research is also on comics, uh, as you already know. But uh, it's a bit, it's a difficult one to navigate because my supervisor at this point, for instance, wants me to um, get a chapter published um, on in a journal or a website, and she she loves that chapter. But I'm like, I don't know how to tell her that I am really keen on getting a monograph published at some point, and I don't want to jeopardize the chances of getting a whole monograph published if you know I have a major chunk of it already published before somewhere somewhere. Whereas else. Um, that said, I know I can't even apply for decent jobs without having publications in place. So I'm a bit confused about what I can do at this point. Shall I go for smaller publications? Should I get a chapter published, an article published? What can I do at this point before I finish my PhD? Thank you, Anacha, for this question. This is something I think many of us are dealing with. Uh, does Harriet or Tom has something from their experience they can share on that? Yeah, hi, Anacha. Um, uh, publish. Now, what you publish is, is, is up to you. Um, one thing that you could do, seeing as you are, you're sort of nearing the final hurdle, is, is send out emails and ask what the press uh, if there's a policy on percentage that can be pre-published elsewhere before it goes into a monograph. Yeah. Um, so I know that with um, the University of Nebraska, which is probably not useful at all, but as an idea, you are allowed to publish elsewhere up to 20%. <clears throat> uh, I don't know if that's kind of standard, but so if you had a chapter that might be say 15%, that would probably be okay. I suppose, the, the problem you have there is that it's almost like a wasted publication. Like you've got a publication on your CV, yeah, but it's actually just part of a book. So if you have um, either, it sounds awful, but like offcuts, you know, the information that doesn't quite make it into the PhD, but you've got it in a Word document somewhere and it's kind of, it's over there and you're not thinking about it, that can make a great publication. Um, and for smaller offcuts, there are journals that take short articles. I mean, you don't have to be writing 8,000 words in one go. And there are some really fantastic American studies ones that take shorter articles. Uh, American Notes and Queries is my personal favorite, but Quarterly Horse is also quite good. Um, so there's that. The other thing that you can do, which I know that I am guilty of, is you have like your, your PhD research is here, and so you write an article that's here. So it's the same theory, it's the same kind of theoretical background, but maybe it's a different text, or you're looking at the 1950s and then you write a paper on the 1960s. So you, it's just a little bit different. You're reusing a lot of your scholarship, but it's not the same, it's a different paper. And, that, and it, doesn't, say, it doesn't take as much writing as a full paper might, but do you see what I mean? You're kind of, piggybacking on work you've already done so that kind of thing can be really useful as well um but I, I do yeah publications before graduation can be really really great on your cv um and you are luckily in comic studies where there are lots of places to do that so <laughs> lovely thank you so much I'd echo what Harriet just said. If you can find a, a facet of a chapter which you haven't managed to include or a particular angle which you can't discuss at length, you could make a journal article hinge on that angle and, and then do that. That's a good way of getting around um, the problem. Um, I had that issue, um, but because I'd written about a particular um, facet of a chapter which I hadn't fully explored in my PhD, um, for a journal article, it wasn't a particular issue. So it's a bit of a balancing act, but you can get there. Perfect. Thank you. I think also to look for uh, special issues of journal, uh, which then can provide you maybe a departing point, which you can then uh, make variation of your work that will better suit that context. But it's 
outside of your overall or overarching argument of the thesis, you know, so to, to be flexible on extracting mm -hmm. themes and even methodologies, but not something that will um, reveal the kind of like the major contribution that your whole thesis as a whole might be doing, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Any other questions? I have some, but I want to give you space to ask. Yeah, there's a hand up from Alexandra Hess. Yes, uh, we agree that uh, at the end we will stop the recording and she can ask the question. We can do that now or. Okay. Um, I can, sorry, um, I can, I can ask the question. I'll just, if you don't mind, I will just omit names um, um it's, it's an etiquette really it's a, it's a question about etiquette most mostly so um if if you're okay with that yeah yeah sure I, you can as you said omit details and 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 okay ask as much as you feel so possible. that's great thank you so much so um my so my situation i have finished my phd um and i work um in a in a research group um uh which has a a, a book deal uh for a, for a series um uh, of books uh which are uh, um have been published by by an american university which uh this this kind of big historical character in american popular culture uh so the university press that was publishing the series of books uh has lost the acquisition editors who were interested in our particular research project um i my the series editors wanted to put my PhD into the series, but now it seems that without these acquisition editors, the series is kind of stuck or might not be happening at all uh, anymore. Or um, they are, were thinking of migrating to a different uh, publisher um, and I'm kind of left hanging. And uh, this, this situation has been going on for, I would say maybe a year. So it's taken, yeah, it's taken a lot of time. So my uh, my question is, how should I behave in this respect? Should I look for a publisher myself, or should I rely on the serious editors who are also a partner in in the research project that we're um, that we're carrying out? Um, yeah. It's not. I I understand it's it's a very difficult uh, question. It's a bit of a tricky situation. But um, I was just wondering what kind of what would the etiquette uh, suggest in this case? Thanks. First of all, thank you, Alessandra, for raising these questions. Um, okay. uh, just to clarify, uh, to verify, like, are you under a contract? And was the no. It was stopped no, with, not. with the publication of your own PhD thesis or the series as a whole that was part of this research group? Uh, the series is part of this research group and um, the research group has got some PhD students from my university who are already published with that. Okay. But uh, after I think the second or third book of the series, uh, these editors uh, left for whatever reason and now the the publisher doesn't want to publish books on this this particular uh, character anymore uh, for whatever reason so that's I it. personally I would have just a, go on I and find a new publisher, but them. uh maybe Harriet and Tom can share from their experience or maybe they've heard something else from their colleagues if you are, are not on under contract and they make it quite clear that they are not interested in these themes or subject or series anymore i wouldn't wait another year yeah 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 it's the the problem is that the serious editors want to place the book somewhere else <laughs> so it's uh, i'm I'm kind of stuck in this. Should I go on my own? Which I mean, I think I've already figured out a publisher that uh, that would be interested. Um, or yeah, 
or not. Thanks. Um, so, Alessandra, that sounds tricky, um, but you are not under contract, so you are absolutely not beholden to the press for anything. Uh, it is your own original work and you can do what you think is best with it. Um, the fact that you've been waiting for a year suggests you have more patience than me. Um, I, it, it sounds like an, an unusual situation, um, but you are the expert. If you don't want it to go in a certain series or with a certain publisher or be taken a certain way, that is, it is your work to do with as you see fit. And so what you think is the best fit for it is the best fit for it. Um, and if that means a completely different publisher, one that has never been mentioned in relation to this group and this project before, then, then that's fine. Uh, as long as you're not breaking a contract, and there are ways to do that if you were, but you're not, so it's fine. Um, then what what you think is best is, is best. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not under contract, but my my the, the trickiness of the situation is that many of the sources of like the historical sources and photographs that I'm using uh, come from a museum associated with the research project and they were under under the, that other publisher, they were the ones covering all the expenses for uh, rights acquisition and that kind of stuff. So in that case, to a new publisher, I would have to omit a lot of material uh, or uh, hoping that they would uh, give permission to, uh, to publish under, under the publisher that I choose. So that's that's kind of the, the tricky, the tricky, that's why I've been waiting mostly. That's... And would it, is it material that would come under fair use? Um, so stuff that you are, for example, if it's an image and you're talking quite in depth, the sort of close reading of an image, it's, it's fair use because without the image, you can't make sense of the analysis, if that makes, if that's clear. Um, uh, in some cases, yes. In other cases, I am not entirely sure. I know that some of the images come from like private collections um, and private collectors. So uh, I'm I'm not sure whether they they would qualify for that. It would that would be something to um, if you identify a press that you're interested in, they will have a legal department who would be able to help you with that. Um, the other person to potentially speak to is uh, the librarian, the university librarian where you're based. So right. they tend to be just little beacons of old knowledge. I love librarians. Um, so being able to speak to them and say, look, this is the problem. These are the images. This is the permission status. Help me. They should be able to, uh, to give some advice. The Library of Congress also has quite a good website on a uh, webpage on um, uh, fair use law and how, how it works in relation to academic texts. Okay. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. Just add to sum up uh, this question, maybe, Alessandra, is that uh, definitely uh, to emphasize things that Harriet said, uh, you should also prioritize yourself. Uh, the kind of uh, question that you are dealing with now, whether I get permission or not, or how much it's going to cost, was things that you would have dealt with to begin with if we're not in this kind of organization that you were part of. So I think you're just having a new start now uh, and having all of these questions unanswered. And you, you might need to find solutions and you might have challenges on the way, but I think it's important not to have you um, set back uh, while these things are uh, happening without your control and you're wasting precious time of work, of uh, advancing and, and yeah. And also try to end up these uh, ties and relationship um, with respect and, and with honesty. And I think, you know, this is the best you can do, um, but you need to prioritize yourself too. Sorry um, to hear me better um, because, uh, yeah, uh, we might need to uh, stop here. And yes. uh, if you have uh, any further questions, sir, you can contact our three invited speakers either through email or their own website or, or uh, the Twitter. And um, so um, thank you so much, uh, Harriet and Tom and also Hannah Rose. 
and uh, thank you, Ali, for uh, moderating the question and answer session. Um, we thank you, Jim, for organizing and initiating this event. Yeah, and thank you all for coming. Release the video soon on our USSO YouTube channel. So if you want to go back and have a look at this video again, you might go to uh, that channel. Um, okay, yeah, thanks so much. Thank you all. Yeah. Bye. 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 Thank you.